Welcome to our Cultural Talk Story Series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Matanai Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Today's event will focus on circle peacemaking in CAKE, a case study of indigenous planning and dispute systems designs, but with Polly Hisla, uh, PhD. Uh, thank you for joining us today to sit down at our table to learn about indigenous communities near and far. Peacemaking is both a way of life and a process to address wrongdoing in the community. The process of circle peacemaking is a restorative practice designed by the community members in Keek, Alaska, a tinglet community located in the southeast part of the state. Peacemaking is based on local values, ancient laws, and traditional knowledge. Uh, let's start today's event by introducing our special guest. Uh, Polly Hislop is an Indigenous peacemaking educator and tribal consultant. She's interested in community empowerment through language revitalization, effective communication, and practice of the peace making as the law of the land. Her interests include the role of outsiders and insiders and facilitators of health and well-being within indigenous communities. Her goal this year is to let go of the fear of bears. <laughs> so um, to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to our good friend, Polly. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thank you, Jose. I actually thought I took that last part out, but I still am trying to let go of my fear of bears. Um, Hello, everybody. I'm so happy and honored to be here. And, and thank you, Jose. And uh, that's an, is it Matsunaga Institute? I should have asked you before. It, it, Matsunaga. Matsunaga, yeah. sorry, um, for inviting me to share today. I'm just honored to be in Hawaii. I suppose I'm in Hawaii today. Um, I'm, I'm beaming in from Alaska, where it's like 31 degrees, and we're expecting snow. And so um, it's just fantastic to, to be there, even though I'm via Zoom. Um, and before I begin, I just want to um, take this time to recognize the first people of the land there and um, the ancestry. And, um, and also the ones yet to be born, um, they are, they're the reason we do our work in peacemaking. And, and also just, I wanted to just reach out to all my brothers and sisters there and, and the spirit of all living things. Um, and because we are all interconnected, we're all together. Um, as, is, as is my custom, I'd like to begin this session in um, prayer. And, um, and I think, did you put the, the prayer that I chose in chat? Okay. So if, if it's possible, I'd like you to read it with me and, um, and take yourself, can, you, can they take themselves off chat, unchat themselves? I mean, off of mute, unmute uh, themselves? Yes, I will make that possible. Oh, fantastic. Yes. So this is a St. Francis prayer. Um, so if you could just join me, that would be fantastic. Um, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, hatred let me so love. love. Where, where there is there is pardon. Where there is where error, there is the, truth. the truth. Where there is where doubt, there is the, faith. the faith. Where there is despair, hope. Oh. Oh. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is, light. Light. Where there where is darkness, darkness, joy. Oh, divine, divine master, master, grant they that I may not so much seek to become so as to console, console, to be understood, as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in for giving, giving that we receive. It is in part that we are pardoned. And, and it is in dying, in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for helping me in that prayer. I totally love that prayer. There's actually other forms of that prayer that are more to today's English. <laughs> but um, let me see. So what I'm going to do next is, um, is since since I, we have an hour and a half, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I I'd like to just um just kind of introduce myself and just briefly, can we go around and have everybody, since we are a small group, introduce themselves and why you're here, um, and just just so that we can get to know each other more. But um, my my name is Polly Hislop. I actually just changed my my the pronunciation of my last name. Uh, <laughs> it's a difficult last name, and um, I am from a small village of uh, called Northway, Alaska, here in uh, in Alaska. I was born there. I was raised in uh, two other villages along the Yukon River. My village is located in interior Alaska, and you'll see it in my PowerPoint presentation. 
Um, I actually have an Indian name. My aunt just recently gave, gave me, uh, and it's, it's hard to, it's, I'm still trying to pronounce it. It's Uki client and that means we can depend on her. It's a name that I feel honored to have. Um, and because I love my elderly relatives here in Alaska. Um, I, I have a PhD in indigenous studies. My work is on circle peacemaking, the design, like how can we as community members work together to create a restorative practice within native communities. Um, and that's just a foundation of a lot of other research I feel is, is it's going to come from that research. Um, yeah, I um, and the, and I just wanted to just briefly introduce myself because I have pictures of my families in my PowerPoint pr presentation. That I'll give you more later, but I'd like to just kind of um, and I'll ask you um, because I can see you on screen to just briefly introduce yourself. Um, let me see what else did I forget. I don't know what I forget about myself, but if you have any questions, um, I. I taught at the local university here, University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, for five years. Um, I was in the restorative justice uh, program. And so I taught a class called Indigenous Dispute Systems Design. And it's really based on my research. And of course, other people's research too. I just melted everything together. And, um, and also my own experience. But, um, but anyway, I'm really, really happy to be here. So. I think I'll go uh, on to Laura. Would you like to introduce yourself to us, Laura? Sure. Um, my name is Laura Rouse. I'm a PhD student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm here today as a graduate assistant for the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, um, where I do research on restorative justice as well as feminist criminology and punishment. And I'm really looking forward to being here today. Laura. Um, Carrie. Aloha Pali and all. My name is Carrie Kuwata Phipps and I work at the Hawaii Community College campus in Kona, Hawaii on the Big Island. And I'm currently enrolled in the graduate certificate uh, for conflict resolution program. And my practicum is on peace circles. So I'm in the process now of um, deploying two surveys uh, looking at uh, transition circle for women coming back to school and possibly one for women's ministry support circle through my church. So really excited to be here. Right. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Lorenda Riley. Aloha, my name is Lorenda Riley and I'm an assistant professor of Native Hawaiian Indigenous Health. Um, and a lot of my research has been around the impacts of the Western criminal justice system on indigenous people and um, just the ways that perhaps indigenous uh, peacemaking might be a healing process. Um, my background is that I have a SJD in indigenous people's law and policy. So I've kind of taken a little bit more of the law and policy angle towards that research, but really happy to be here. Aloha. Thank you so much, Linda. Sorry, it's like I can't see this my screen. So is Madeline? Yes, hi, uh, my name is Madeline. I am a Master of Clinical Social Work student at the University of Calgary in the city of Mokinsis in Alberta, Canada. Um, I'm currently engaged in a self-directed practica. I'm looking at uh, holistic ways of knowing using Indigenous pedagogy um, for mental health practitioners. Um, and I am Blackfoot Métis, Nitsune Itaki. Thank you. Jim. Aloha, this is Jim Herman. I'm in uh, Hawaii Kai. Aloha, everybody. My wife and I, I just retired from the diplomatic corps. I was a U.S. diplomat for 28 years, and I, we retired back to Hawaii. I just got my degree in conflict transformation from Eastern Mennonite University, um, and I'm my, I'm also a, an executive coach and a life coach, and I teach leadership, experiential leadership using the circle process and a lot of other experiential tools. And my mission is try to how to figure out how to bring these restorative practices to large organizations. And they're deeply skeptical of this. And I feel like with all the amazing community work being done, how do you get large organizations to meet you halfway so it can spread more quickly? Fantastic. Thanks. Pamela. 
Hi, Polly. I'm Pamela, and I'm a professor emeritus at Seattle University in uh, leadership and professional studies in the College of Education. And I um, teach primarily social justice for professional practice, which includes different ways of shifting our, co our consciousness and mindset and calibrating a whole different way of looking at the world, which is what is necessary, particularly now. Um, and I, I do a lot of circles and circle practice. And so always looking for more. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's never enough. Um, so, and I'm I'm finally getting to lunch because I've been in things all day. So, um, looking forward to hearing more. Thank Thanks, you. Molly. I'm Polly. Ryan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan. Uh, hi, Polly. Uh, hi. My name is. Uh, I just put in the chat too, so I would just read it. Uh, I'm from Rhode Island. Uh, I'm a father who has suffered uh, bias in the family court judicial system. Um, I'm exploring how the family court judicial system can stop punitive punishment and evolve towards practicing restorative family uh, justice. Uh, my background is in teaching uh, from middle school, high school, college, and graduate, and uh, the visual arts. Thank you, Ryan. Are you in Hawaii now too? Uh, no, I'm, I'm still in Rhode Island. Okay, oh, fantastic. I don't know why I read that wrong. Okay, thank you. Nicole. Hi, uh, my name's Nicole Scheiber and I am in the state of Minnesota and I do not have an educational background. I work at the Minnesota Department of Human Services and I think I found out about this um, event through an equity newsletter at work and just interested in hearing more about the circle peacemaking process and listening to the stories and um, just widening my viewpoint. Okay, thank you, glad you're here. Thanks. We had a new, somebody just joined us, V, Kalia, can you help? Kale. Kale. <laughs> okay, <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself to us? Sure. Uh, what, are, what are we? What are we wanting to do? So, so sorry, I'm late. I was doing another meeting. No worries. It's just just let us know who you are. And, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, I am Kale Kanuha. I am Kanaka Maoli, uh, born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, and I am now residing uh, on the lands of the Coast Salish people in Seattle, Washington. Um, uh, and I am at the School of Social Work uh, here at UW. Uh, and my title is Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, I was, uh, I've been here for five years. Prior to that, I was at the University of Hawaii for almost 20 in both sociology and social work. And um, my main area of work is on gender-based violence and um, the use of uh, traditional Hawaiian culture and practices to intervene in uh, gender violence in, um, uh, community violence and looking at, at uh, culturally based alternatives to the criminal legal system in the United States. So how could I not want to be on this call? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad you're joining us. So um, so I think right now I'll go right to my PowerPoint presentation. There are a lot of photos. It's like a photo kind of essay. I love photos and um, I don't love words so much anymore, which is weird because uh, I'm academic. But, um, and I was going to, I'll share, I'll start by sharing my screen. And um, I think I kind of know what I'm doing. So I think this is it. Yes. So I think I have to expand it. Here we go. Okay, can everybody see it? I'm assuming everybody can. So, um, so I'm not quite sure how to get rid of this list the side, but we don't need to. Uh, on, you can go to present mode. Uh, there is a, on the... Can you see where, where I'm at? Yep, yep. Uh, if you actually go to the bottom, there's a couple, you see the little button that's clicked in on the bottom panel. If you click yeah. on two buttons okay. over on the bottom panel. All right. Little, yeah, like right. that. Oh, you just scrolled it over, the other one, the other one. Oops. Yep. 
The one to the right. Okay, this one. Yes, that'll get you. There we go. Fantastic. So um, the the title of my presentation is "We Have to Do This for Ourselves," and um, and so it's basically taking the person who said it was Mike Jackson, and he's Tlingit Haida from Cake Alaska, and it is Cake C A K A K E, and it's it sounds just like C A K E. And when I did my research in Cake, he was the state magistrate judge there, but since he has, he has since retired but he's still the keeper of the circle for the cake circle peacemaking there. And so, um, yeah, so let me see if I can, now how do I actually, oh, okay, here's a photo of cake, uh, parts of cake. It's a beautiful, beautiful location in Southeast Alaska. If you're familiar with Juneau or capital of Alaska, it's located there. It's, it's a, the community is located on an island in cake. So I had to fly there or take the ferry there. Uh, when I went to Cake, and I absolutely have incredible memories of, of Cake and, and their beautiful community and the beautiful people there. Um, so the story that I'm going to tell you is about how Cake, the people of Cake uh, created this change in the community. Uh, we always think that creating change is easy if we have the funding, they, uh, whatever, if, but it, as we all know as change agents, or um, problem solvers, that change doesn't come quickly, but they did create a peacemaking circle in their community by, by themselves. Um, and so, uh, be, and I'll go on furthermore in my, my, uh, my story here. Um, they, their dispute resolution process, they call, they, they call circle peacemaking. And at that time, they were working with young people who had gotten into trouble, wrongdoers in this system. Um, and um, and then, this was a very effective process. It reduced the uh, recidivism rate by incredible amount. I don't have the numbers, but a lot. Um, so it's a, like I said, it's a Tlingit community. Let's see if I can go to the next one. And um, my research is titled Circle Peacemaking in Cake Alaska, a case study of indigenous planning and dispute systems design. And basically, and I graduated, I'm actually just graduated in 2018. And the person behind me is uh, one of my members of my committee. Um, she's still a great mentor today, Dr. Beth Leonard. And uh, anyway, uh, so really my question was, um, how did cake create circle peacemaking, um, a sustainable, well, I don't know if it, it's, it, was, it is sustainable dispute resolution process in cake. And, and I'll tell you why I asked that question, um, you know, uh, as I go on with my story um, and how they were the problem solvers. They were problem solvers in cake, or we call them change agents. So they're people who are really invested in their community. Um, what I learned um, in my research is that peacemaking is a way of life. Uh, it's based on our teachings, our values uh, within our community. Um, and, uh, and it's a restorative practice uh, and it, that I learned it was designed. Um, but it, it's, it's a real local practice. Uh, what works in Cake may not work in my community of Northway, uh, what they did. Um, although I, I, I have a firm belief that we, we as indigenous people and we as human people share a lot of the same values. Uh, one is like helping out one another. And, um, and so this process was to address wrongdoing in the community. So let's see if we go on to the next one. And, and before I go any further, I just wanted to like show you where I'm from. I'm from the Arrow, a small village called Northway. Oh, I think where there are 50 families there. We maybe, but it's, but it's, um, it's a road, it's on the road system, which is like none, very uncommon. Most of our villages here in Alaska, you have to fly to. There are 223 tribes in Alaska. 
um, federally recognized tribes. We have almost half of the tribes of the whole nation of Alaska, of, of the whole United States in Alaska. Um, we are not recognized by our state court system. We are at our sovereignty, but we are recognized, our sovereignty is recognized by the federal court system, federal government. So uh, we do have tribal courts. I just wanted to let you know. And Northway, uh, our claim to fame in Northway um, that we call Nabia Ning, that's our um, native name, is that we're the coldest place in Alaska. <laughs> we love it. No, we don't really love it. But um, with climate change now, that a lot of that has changed. Um, there, this is kind of a photo of the winter in Alaska. And um, at the bottom right of what we call moccasins. And we give them away as gifts or we wear them. And they're made of moose skin and beading. And it looks like beaver, um, beaver hair. That's a bird's, eye, bird, a bird's eye view of the old village of Northway where people still live. We have an old village and a new village. Uh, I live from the road to the village. There's like seven miles. And then there's a highway. So our community is pretty spread out. We're kind of a wetland sanctuary in the summers. So um, from where I live in the summers, I can hear um, the geese and the uh, swans and uh, they, come, they come back to our village um, to, to a nest and raise their young. And so um, it's, it's actually a very beautiful, quiet place there. Um, and I, I am always including a little bit of my language. I'm a language learner. So what I'm saying here by when I say Shna, Polly Dimit Hyslip, mostly it's my mother. My mother's name is Polly Dimit Hyslip, Shta Floyd Hyslip. And, it, and my father, um, and I recently learned, um, and I knew this all along, but I recently been doing more research through my brother, that my father is from Scotland. And um, so his grandfather's from Scotland. So I have um, about 26% of Scottish blood in me. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's great. I just, I just love the fact that I, have, um, that I have relatives in Scotland. And my mother, oh, okay. Anyway, my mother is from Northway and she's, um, she's Upper Tanana. Well, we're both um, Upper Tanana uh, at the Baskin Dine. The Upper the Tanana River begins down river from our village. This is just a recent view. We, it no longer looks like this. We're getting into winter, but um, of the road that leads into my village. And of course, I'm so very proud of my grandmother, Nabia Ning Odin. It just means the people of, of Northway. She has long since passed away, but she's, she's the uh, woman in the uh, blue dress. Uh, her name is Bertha John Dimmitt. And uh, yeah, she's, she, it, it's interesting um, uh, that she could only speak the Upper Tanana language. And I, my first language, I was the first generation of my first language, English. So there was already a disconnect growing up. Um, but I, but she's still my grandmother, and she had a lot to teach me. So uh, jump ahead a couple of generations. There's my son on the right, Benjamin, and his cousin Raymond. And so today they meet each other at airports. You know, so this is at a Seattle airport because they both travel for their jobs. And my son lives in Reno, and he just recently graduated with an MBA in business there in Reno, so I'm pretty proud of him. So really what I'm looking at today is um, creating change within our indigenous communities. And I just put best practices in there and, and I'm not sure if they're best practices, they're just practices and principles that I learned in my research in Cake Alaska and how they created a, a peacemaking, circle peacemaking within their community. Okay, I'm actually not following my notes at all, so I better go back and see if I've forgotten anything. Um, so, uh, you know, that's basically what I'm going to the next slides. What I'm going to share with you is like what I discovered in my research. 
And some of it is new and some of it is what probably you know already. And I've already told Jose, if you have any questions, um, you can put it in chat and Jose will just uh, stop me because I'm okay with you asking questions as we go along. I'm a teacher um, by profession. So um, anyway, so just, um, I'm okay. So um, I wanted to first start off by saying that uh, I am trained as a, as a restorative justice practitioner. Um, I'm, and I also can do peacemaking circles. I've been trained as a mediator, but, that, but where I come to this, this research or come to the field is as a change agent, as a problem solver, as, as a person who, uh, who will help communities reach their goals and uh, of creating change within the communities. Um, I started my career as it is now, and I better actually be watching my time. It's 12.30, um, is um, as a participant for what we call the Upper Tenant Wellness Circle in, a, in Tok Alaska. It was um, it, at the court system in Tok Alaska, which is like an hour drive from my village. And it's a mostly white community. And of course, uh, the judge was uh, non-native. And, um, and we got a lot of money from the state of Alaska to, re to, to build a restorative justice program with the state of Alaska. And amazingly, within two years, we went belly up. And, um, and so what I bring to the research are my, my experiences as um, failing to create that change within um, the communities um, in the upper town in our region of Alaska. And that's only one story. <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot from, um, from, because I've always been, a, I would say a change agent. I've always been the doer out in the front lines and I have failed many times and, um, and I don't call them failures. I just call them lessons that I've learned. And, and so K the residents of Cake Alaska helped me a lot to learn how we can actually create the change that we wanna see within our communities and within our organizations. You know, my, my study looks at, um, brings in what's called dispute systems design. Um, and that's what I borrowed from uh, mediators, um, creating change within the organizations. Um, and let me see, what, what was one of my biggest failures <laughs> when uh, with the upper tenant and a wellness circle? Um, no show, no interest. Uh, we were out to help um, the native people because they had a big problem with their youth, um, underage drinking. So we came together as community, concerned community members in Tok Alaska, where I was working at the time. And we had a lot of um, participation. We had the local troopers, the teachers, the judge. Uh, um, and so we had the right, we had a lot of interest, but we didn't have native people showing up to our meetings, which we met once a month at this Tok, Tok Courthouse. Um, we, we had a lot of money. So it's like we had dinners, we had trainings. Um, yeah, so we just, we just didn't. So that, that was what I would kept thinking, why are they not showing up? We have such great um, opportunities. We, I was trained as a restorative justice practitioner. Uh, I just like, we have seen the light and we're trying to like spread the joy and nobody's interested. This is an old map or this old chart. Uh, um, this is um, the rates of incarceration, um, native people in Alaska uh, in our criminal justice system. Uh, this is in 2014, it's 39% Alaska Native, Native Americans. So we have a huge issue here in Alaska. Um, so I looked up I looked up like 2020 and I think the, and I know, I'm not saying I think, I know that um, the population of incarceration has gone up to 50%. And, um, and so it, the problem is not going away, it's getting worse. 
uh, and and it's frustrating. And um, and and so it's frustrating to me to see this as a researcher. And um, so it's like there's still a lot of work to be done. So for my for my research, I created this um, term called indigenous dispute systems design. And it's based upon indigenous planning and um, the principles and practices of dispute systems design. So I just melded of like the indigenous ways of, of working, doing with, um, with non-indigenous uh, practices, which, will, which worked in um, cake, though they did not probably know that they were practicing DSD, we call it DSD, dispute systems design. And it basically, it's how we, we want, we talk about being problem solvers and we have been problem solvers for since time began. We, we sat around fires. This is a recent photo of a friend of mine who sent, who sent it to me uh, sitting at a campfire. You can see the, the rocks around, there's a circle. It's a, um, and we used to sit around and talk about our problems around campfires, um, sitting around at the table. If there's conflict, uh, we would sit around the table and talk about the conflict. We talk to each other. We resolve the conflicts together. Um, today, there's a lot of professionalism. Um, sometimes it's best to take off the professional hat, I was told, and just become one with the circle. Um, that's uh, that's basically really uh, what Mike Jackson teaches is that when we go into the circle, we take off our hat or we sit with the people we're equal together here. We're going to solve some problems. I just like that visual, it's warm. Well, I don't know about Hawaii, but it's like, it's a good visual for Alaska. So here's some practices and principles of IDSD, uh, Indigenous Dispute Systems Design, and they're not in that order. I just didn't, I still haven't yet to put them in a circle, but, and I'll just briefly go, go through them with the rest of my dissertation or my uh, presentation, but um, make peacemaking a way of life, envision a safer and healthier community, begin dialogue, hold community meetings, define the conflicts in your community, prepare for resistance, that's a big one. Create capacity for peacemaking and recognize place-based leadership and create close working relationship with outside support systems. So really that's basically the rest of my, uh, my, my presentation here. And if you have any questions or anything, please let me know because I can't really actually see the chat from here. So, uh, okay. So I'm gonna start with make peacemaking a way of life. Um, this is interesting to me because I always thought peacemaking was a process and it is, you sit in a circle, you have somebody who has created some kind of conflict or um, people or, and you sit in the circle and you resolve that conflict. And peacemaking is bringing in local values and ways of, of practice. Um, like I said, what happened, what works in cake may work differently in Northway. We have ways um, based on um, our teachings uh, of resolving conflict that we don't often practice today because the court system has pretty much these um, have, are still pretty much in control. Although I can see where the court system is is trying to um, to work with tribes. So I don't know if any of you know uh, Chief Justice Robert Yazzie of the Navajo Nation. Uh, he spent a couple of weeks in Alaska um, a couple of years ago, and we would talk about relationships and how, um, how things would work um, in different communities. And he'd always say, this is peacemaking. And I always thought, why is he talking about? We're not sitting in circles, but peacemaking is really a way of life, how we choose to present ourselves and how we choose to view life. Um, peacemakers are facilitators of change. Uh, we have to be the, the, the change that we want and uh, to see in our communities. Um, yeah, and you know, the change begins with me and then I can, you know, the change can begin with my family system and my community, the local region and just 
all over the world, you know, that, that um, ripple effect. The peacemaking that I'm talking about doesn't depend on politics or funding. It's a, it's a guide, peacemaking is a guide based on our values, what we've learned, how to be good people. And the education system that we as indigenous people really taught us, how do we get along? How do we help out one another? How do we survive in our environment? Um, and that was basically, we didn't have books back then. You know? So really our teachers were our elders, our, in, our aunties, our uncles, um, our community members. Um, and so, um, you know, we were taught to be kind to each other and how were, were we taught through storytelling, you know, um, and, and just um, having maybe my uncles take the young men out to teach them how to hunt and how to respect the environment. Um, anyway, you get the idea like peacemaking as a way of life. The second one is envision a safer and healthier community. Um, I just, these are all photos that um, I took while traveling to and from cake and on a ferry. And I would sit out on a deck, it would be beautiful and just kind of just enjoy the beauty and knowing that I was on kind of a, the right path by going to, to, uh, to Cake Alaska with my research. Uh, and the reason um, I, they taught me to envision a safer and healthier community is because um, it's that vision that's going to get us through the storms and the valleys as we go there. And, and I've also learned that what we envision, we may not see in our own lifetime. It, it's something, it's, um, it's setting the stage or working to connect um, with other people, networking, and uh, to just start, to start the process. I asked um, the circuit, Mike Jackson, the keeper of the circle, how do you know that this peacemaking circle will continue after you retire or if you move back to uh, another place? And, and I asked other peacemakers and what they told me was uh, basically they're trusting the process and the process is, is not, a, it's just the process is a spiritual process. Um, Mike Jackson would always say peacemaking, what I'm telling you, and what we know now is just the tip of my fingernail. And I've never really quite understood it. When I've, you know, and I think I'm beginning to understand more what he really meant is that what we're doing is we, and I heard somebody say, we're becoming more aware. We, we need to start changing our consciousness um, about uh, the, our world and, and about the environment. And so it's, um, it's really a peacemaking and um, is a, is a it's a spiritual uh, process. Okay, so this is a big one, whole community meetings. And uh, Kate held a lot of community meetings and all of it, a lot of it centered around food and they had excellent food. But also it's what I wanted to add is like, um, the dialogue needs to begin. Uh, how do we actually do dialogues within our communities? Um, and usually um, I can just say from my own community, um, it's, uh, we don't dialogue very well. <laughs> not, not to, we're, we're a great community. My village is, I, I love my village and I'm very proud of my village, but we're not dialoguing very well any of uh, these days. And it, and it's been happening for some time. Um, we, we, but the dialogue needs to begin. And I talked to, I'm talking to you and me as, um, as problem solvers within our community. And I can also, you know, this can actually work within organizations as well, I believe. But let's start talking to each other. Let's start listening to each other um, and um, effectively, you know, um, and, and the dialogue can begin just by talking to each other, going and making a face within the community, getting to know people, um, because peacemaking is all about relationships, all about relationships, good relationships, healthy. To find the conflicts in your community, you know, if we can just sit down and talk about what is it that we really is really not working within my community or organizations. 
So I borrowed this from dispute systems design. We need to define what's really happening. In my community, in Upper Tanana, um, in Tope, we had underage drinking. Um, so, um, so it's like, okay, we knew that there was a problem. The kids were drinking a lot. And, um, but really, is that just a surface problem? You know, it's like, why were the kids drinking a lot? Um, maybe there are not enough, you know, maybe the issue was that there are not, a, not enough attention to them after school or, you know, there's not. A, and so one of the communities actually started doing more after school activities and uh, for their community, for the young people. So really, when we look, you know, when we define the conflicts within our community, we can start, we, it would just be write them all down and then really start discussing them. Um, and actually, when you want to know what the conflicts are, you can just ask people. Like, you, we don't have to have community meetings. We can just say, like, you know, usually people will express their problems in the community. In my community of Northway, we're having a lot of problems with uh, drug addiction now. And so, um, and we actually, there was a team of people who actually started becoming real, um, they, they become vigilant and making sure they knew who was driving in our community and stuff and stopping the uh, drug trafficking. And it's a small community, so you know who owns what car. But, um, but I started thinking about it, what's the real issue here? Like the issue is um, drug addiction or drugs coming into our community, but you know, addiction's the issue. So maybe we should start bringing in more 12-step programs or something, addressing it more in school. So see what I'm, where I'm going here. Um, the gentleman on the left um, and his wife, they lost um, a daughter to suicide. And Cake at that time had a high level of suicide. And that's when Cake started talking about, you know, what are we gonna do? There's, their suicide rate was enormous. It was like one of the highest in the nation and Cake is a small community. So he and his wife, uh, and that's our grandson there, were part of my study. They, they just, um, they knew that it was a problem. So, you know, suicide was a problem and, and drinking was a problem. So they wanted to be part of the solution and they became peacemakers within the community. And um, he shared the story with us, uh, with me. And um, it's heartbreaking, you know, it's heartbreaking, but they were, they were courageous enough to become part of the solution. They didn't want that happening to anybody else. Oh, okay. Um, so, Whatever we do, we, you know, we as change makers are problem solvers we ha within communities or organizations. This is what I borrowed from dispute systems design is prepare for the resistance. And, um, and change, even good change, will we'll meet resistance. I don't know if that's just human nature or whatever it is, but this is where a lot of efforts stop is where the resistance, you know, when resistance uh, meets effort. And um, I've had my own experience where we just said, well, you know what, we don't know what to do. We're surprised to resist, especially with our restorative justice uh, uh, process in the Upper Tanana. Um, we, we were surprised. I mean, I was. I actually, we'd go out to the communities uh, surround, uh, around our tote, and we, and we were, pre I was presenting, I was the one all excited about it presenting this restorative justice process. And I actually asked at one community, would you prefer this than to the court system working with their youth? And they said the court system. Uh, one person said that, and I was surprised. And the reason is, is because change is scary. So you have to, we have to prepare for the resistance. We have to know there's going to be resistance. We can, and we can actually write down what type of resistance are, the, you know, are we going to face here? And one is like, um, I don't like change. You know, change is scary. You know, so it's like, um, so we just have to know that we ha there's, we have to know that that's going to happen in our community. Let me see what, do I have anything else that I wanted to share with Prepare for Resistance? Yeah, and change is slow. Unfortunately, 
unless it's climate change and I don't see it as a joke, you know. Um, as change makers, we have to we have to be we have to earn that trust within our communities when we bring in the change. Um, what Cake did when they brought, when they when they had the peacemaking circle uh, started practicing it is uh, they they met with a lot of resistance from the churches. Amazingly, Cake has a lot of churches there, a lot of religions and um, from the local leaders, what they did was they invited them to sit within the circle and to participate in the circle and the resistance diminished and, um, and cakes started in, in, uh, inviting the enveloped um, this process. They started accepting it. Actually, it's a process that was part of cakes practice for a long time and uh, unfortunately, in 1959, when the state of Alaska, when Alaska became a state, the state court system uh, took away a lot of local autonomy. I'm actually going faster than I thought I was going to be. So there'll be a lot of room for questions and comments. Oh, okay. So create capacity for peacemaking. This is something that we put together at the university and it's working there. Um, it's like create trainings and, and we need to get the word out. This is what's happening. Uh, restore justice, putting justice in hands of the people. Uh, Harold Gattensby is a well-known name in the White Horse uh, region of Canada. He's Clinket Haida, he's a peacemaker. He's uh, created a peacemaking process in White Horse. And, um, and so we brought him to our university and that's before Zoom became popular and he Zoomed in. I don't, I don't believe that, yeah, he didn't, he did, couldn't make it to Alaska. So he Zoomed in from, um, from his community. And so creating capacity for, for peacemaking is huge because we, ha we must get the word out. I brought Harold to my community of Northway and it's the first time they've ever heard of peacemaking or of uh, restorative practices. And they sat interested for about three days and then they started talking, but on the third day it was only a three day workshop. Um, and he should, we, hopefully he'll be able to come back. But it's, it's just, it's changing consciousness. It's, it's educating people. It's marketing actually. It's like, we, we can't expect people to accept what they don't understand. And, um, and so it's like, you know, create capacity for peacemaking. I see a lot of opportunity for uh, creating capacity. It's not only about information sharing, it's about creating restorative practices within our community organizations. For me, it's like, why don't we have beating circles where we can get together and talk? You know, why can't we learn from each other through beating circles? I worked a lot with the youth and dance groups. That's where I connected with their moms or grandparents. Um, and so there's like dancing, bead making, um, all sorts of opportunities for creating capacity. I, 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 my first degree is in journalism. I, I teach in the communication department. I know that right now, if we could learn to speak together effectively, and um, without, when we get mad at each other in my community, there's a lot of hollering. We're loud voices there and, uh, and swearing. And that's not, that's not a good way to resolve conflict and it doesn't resolve conflict. Um, I have an example uh, of my other home called Tanana that's located along the Yukon River. About four years ago, uh, two troopers were shot and killed in a home there in Tanana. And Tanana, the residents of Tanana, they were devastated. So they got together and started holding community meetings. But out of the community meetings, there was a lot of putting down of one another and it didn't resolve anything. It just created a lot more um, you know, resentments. And so today they still live together, but in the community, but it's like, it didn't, it just created more separation. So, you know, Bringing in trainings on how to conduct meetings, you know, that are effective that um, and resolving conflict. So that's kind of my idea about creating capacity for peacemaking. I'm sure you have other ideas too, and I'd like to hear more about it. Um, let's see what else do we have. 
I think you know, kind of this story tells it all as recognized place-based leadership. We have leaders within our community that are super cool and, and they have a lot to offer us, our elders. Um, they have, um, when I first moved home, cause I, I was this um, ambitious young woman who made it to New York City actually. And um, when I came home in 1995 to my village, I had a lot of training, retraining to do. And the elders, my aunties would sit down and they'd tell me stories. And I would think, why are they telling me that story again? And there, that was their training. That's how they were training me to become a person that um, in my community, because I had a lot of this New York attitude going on in my small community. So they were retraining me to become a member of my community again. Um, what the other place-based leadership, and I think what I'm talking about more is like a lot of communities go to the tribal court, the tribal members of sitting on a council they aren't often, I hope I don't get in trouble saying this, but it's, I think they're not often the best uh, candidates. They're voted in, they're po political. Um, and and I'm not to say, that, not to dismiss them at all um, because they do have a lot of influence, but our leadership is within, you know, the, the native people, the elders, the people, the former wrongdoers, the ones who've actually, have gone out and made a mess of their life and come back and um, straightened out their lives. They're, and, and, and not all people are like that within communities, but there are some, a lot actually in my community who've stopped drinking, stopped, you know, and, and are just really good members of our community. Volunteers, watch out for those volunteers. They're, they will invest in the communities and the young people. Let's go on the next one. Oh, creating working relationships. And I think that might be my last one. I'm not quite sure. But um, this is a photo of, of me. Actually, you can see me, I'm standing right there. I'm kind of the short one um, standing up there. But this is, a, this is a, a meeting that we all met in Denver and at uh, the Restorative Justice Conference there in Denver, Colorado in about three years ago. But it was a melding of mediators of, of uh, professors, of practitioners and restorative justice practitioners and peacemaking practitioners. You know, we all should be working together, court officials, judges, we should be working together. We should make that effort to have tea together, get to know each other. And like I said, again, it's like take off our professional hats and sit down and, and recognize who we are as humans. And what, where, what, what is it that we envision? What is it that we want to work towards together? Okay, so this is the end of my presentation, but I took this photo off of, I think, on the side of a house and cake, and I just totally love it. Uh, a lot of our work with what I'm doing is um, for this generation, but also for the ones yet to be born. I do want to create a world and a life where there's a lot more peace. And, um, and so um, I just prefer, you know, that my life efforts are as a, as a change agent, as a problem solver would be to um, create that change. I think that most of us who are here have that, that's, uh, that same type of uh, uh, kind of goal in our, in our lives. Um, so I didn't actually have a closing, uh, except uh, that I really, I think that my, this, this research that, I've, that I conducted um, is sort of a, the beginning of further research and further work because we are at the time I, on our planet with uh, climate change and, uh, and all sorts of other conflict but I think it's because what's heavy is like, I teach a class at the university here now on climate change. And I realize that um, we need to work together and we need to, um, and we need to communicate effectively together. And, uh, and so I'm not really like, I, although my focus is on rest restorative justice and peacemaking, the creating within systems, 
um, I see where it connects to uh, climate change because, um, you know, because once we connect with the land again and with all living beings, we start connecting to the, our true selves. And, um, and that's, it's hard for me to describe, but I think a lot of you understand what I'm saying is that we start reconnecting to everyone and, and to all living beings. And so we want to, we want to start becoming more responsible um, as human beings of this planet. So um, I'm just gonna end on that note. I think I'm, gosh, um, hey, I, I left about a half an hour for discussion, uh, for comments, for questions. I have to say in advance, I may not have all the answers. So thanks. And I, th I think what, can I just take this, this off the screen now? I yes, can, yes, yeah. uh, or I can, uh, yep, you can. Yeah, there we go. Forward. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Polly. Uh, there's actually some questions that we have uh, from some of our community in the chat. So uh, I'll just jump in. Uh, uh, well, Kalei had asked though, why was talk mainly white? Okay, so um, it, it's a community that was built during World War II and it was a military community. And um, the, the communities the surround Tok our native communities, because our native communities were there, you know, since gosh knows when. But uh, so it was basically built during the as a military. I think it's like military installation or place, um, and so it just remained mostly white. So, yeah. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay. Thanks. Somebody else had asked, uh, rather than having circles in the building you had shown, did you make efforts to have peacemaking circles on location in the native villages and their homes and their community? Oh, that's a great question, Ryan. Um, and we did, actually. We had a circle in my community and I was so super amazed that, uh, that you know, we're, we're famously late for everything, but everybody showed up ahead of time. Uh, we had food there, and so we ate before we sat down in the circle, and it was it was amazing. I learned so many things. I I was sitting next to this woman that I was always politically a rival towards in my community. I was heavily into politics before I stopped being heavily into politics, and uh, and we were sitting in a circle together, side by side, and focusing on the youth that had gotten into trouble, we had put aside all our differences. And so it was amazing the this power of the circle. And yes, we did have a circle in our community. Um, would it have, the, the thing is, would it, it didn't continue. It, it The community didn't adopt it. We brought the circle into the community. And so there might be, you know, I believe the community, it, everything, all change be that's sustainable begins from the community up. We were the top, we were to to courthouse and we were coming in and we did the circle and it worked for that time. But when we left, when our funding ran out and we, you know, I, we all left, it didn't continue. And in cake it did because it started in cake. So I hope I answered your question. Right. And, uh, I see Jim has his hand up, so I'll let Jim take it over. Sure, Jim. Uh, Aloha, Polly. Thanks for this. Loved it. Um, let me take my hand off so that I don't confuse anybody. Um, so forgive me, I'm going to put my coaching hat on and my perhaps my projection onto what you're saying. It seems like you might, there was such a powerful theme going through everything you said about what you learned and what you brought to each situation. And that the change started to come about for you when you were, went back home and your elders were talking story to you as we talk about in Hawaii. And in my experience, that is such a powerful insight for anybody that's doing this work. In fact, this is, I don't know if you can see this. This is the, what I use when I'm teaching for peace builders because I graduated from EMU in conflict transformation. And it's centered on this B in the center and how we're related to the community, to what we're learning and the people. And then it has the values that we're trying to bring to it. And that just came out to me. I don't, again, I think I might be rejecting, but I heard that loud and clear from what you were saying. And I was wondering if you would care to comment on that. Um, actually, I don't quite, a, the, the values within our community. I, let me see if I understand your question. Great, um, okay. 
Yeah. So you're, are you asking like, uh, how, how do we define what, values or? No, no. What you bring to it, what you yourself bring to the space. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. I think that we, we, I think the part of the discussion in the community, uh, we we need to become more aware of our values because we stuff them aside, especially as a native people, because the system, the the bigger, the, not the bigger, I didn't say that, but yeah. the, the, the foreign system came to our community and imposed their values upon us and brought in mm. their schools, their institutions. And, and so we, as native people, put aside our values are we internalized it it didn't go away you know the storytelling never went away we internalized it so what we're doing now is we're starting to recognize that we do have some real sustaining values that we can now practice we should we are practicing you know but we should be practicing more about looking out mm. for our elders helping out one another sharing our moose like when I, I got a we got a moose last year and we share it with community members who didn't get a moose and um and just um and even how we talk to each other and think about each other there are some there are some teachings about you know our clan relationship within my community it's it's like uh we we shouldn't be saying things about them because we violate some real spiritual laws about karma. I mean, I don't know how right. it's like we bring we bring harm to ourselves when we're trying to harm people. So these are things that that have never gone away. These are values and teachings that have never gone away. But what we want to do is we want to start bringing them back and start practicing them again because the court system's not working, the criminal justice system's not working. Um, any kind of well, actually um, institution that's been imposed upon us have, are not really working the educational system, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, practicing our values, becoming peacemakers ourselves. Um, you know, we don't actually need to go to school to become a peacemaker. We can become right. peacemaking by internalizing and learning what we, and practicing our own value system. And that's not being practiced a lot in our communities. I have to say that, and I don't, and so I'd like to, I'd like to know why, you know, so it's like, I, if I can leave you with more questions and answers, I feel like that's kind of my job as well then, because I have a lot of questions, like, why is that, that we're not doing what we should, you know, what we know what we should be doing? Why is that, you know? Um, and, and I, like I say, I love my community, but it, I think what's happening is we, we have another system imposed upon us that we're, we need to become more aware that that's not our system. You know, our system, we're taught to help out each other. We're taught, you know, we have an education system that's foreign to our, to our values. And so we, we need to start, I think we should be stepping up to the plate and saying, well, actually I'm using a baseball term, aren't I? But um, we need to start becoming responsible again it's really, it's not, I like, I like the terms like not about our rights, but it's about being responsible because if I become more responsible, my, actually my, my research changed me. I realized that I had some young people, my sister's granddaughters to my family who were going through problems, but I was always too busy. Busy's become another um, excuse um, to pay attention to them. I began to pay more attention to them because I knew that I was an influence within my family system. You see what I'm saying, where I'm going? I don't know if I'm actually geared off course here, but- um, uh, Great yeah. answer, thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Polly. Uh, and, and Jim, uh, Kalei has her hand up, so I will let Kalei take it away with her questions. Sure, Kalei. Um, Aloha, Polly. I just think, um, you know, in some ways, I, I so appreciate the presentation because in, in my work in Hawaiian communities around um, gender and family violence, um, we had a lot of the same kind of struggles about implementing and using uh, traditional Hawaiian uh, practices. And um, I, I would say in the, the years that, um, that a, a, a group of us developed a Hawaiian cultural uh, intervention for uh, domestic violence, 
and sexual violence and family violence, a couple of things happened. One is we worked with um, um, male, males who had harmed their female partners and their children. And we also, so we did groups for them. And then we also did groups for uh, women who were survivors of that kind of harm. And what we found is that it was really hard to get Hawaiian men to come forward and do the groups with us. It was always the Hawaiian women who would, were, were happy to help out, right? But Hawaiian men just, just kind of just wouldn't do it. And, um, and there were, you know, and I had a lot of conversations with uh, my friends and, and, um, um, and, and people who were close to me about like, come on guys, don't, don't you wanna help our men to be what we hope that they can be? Um, and a lot of them said, we have so, so much pain in our own histories and uh, so much pain and trauma in our own histories like these are like I just want to say these are like professors okay <laughs> some that probably some people on, on this call probably know who some of these guys are and, and they say we have so much pain and trauma in our own histories of violence in our own relationships in our families that we feel that we shouldn't be working on this because we haven't done our own work so that goes back to your your point Polly right about the resistance in some ways is about um having to deal with our own trauma and cultural um, and, and uh, historical and cultural trauma and interpersonal trauma. Um, and I also think, honestly, this is really about colonization. That's it. To me, the bottom line is that the, the strength of white supremacy and colonization is so uh, endemic to all of us and our ways of thinking and acting and valuing that somehow it's like, Really, we want to do our Hawaiian practices. I'd rather call 911. So there still is this heavy reliance on white, Western, male dominated uh, pa patriarchal systems that make up the criminal legal system. And we'd rather go there than go back to our own ways because uh, it's, it's really about having to decolonize ourselves. And I think people are very afraid to, to, go, to go back to something that's deep in our heart and it's in our DNA, but we're afraid of that. So I think the resistance is, is about colonization. So that, that's just my, my thought about that. Thank you so much for your work. Yeah, I appreciate what you said. And I, I'd, I'd love to hear what other people are saying because I, I, it's interesting because in my village and we're a small village, um, when things happen, we don't have troopers, we call them troopers here uh, in our village. We, that's the last thing we're going to do is call them. And that's always been why. So I would, I mean, when I first moved home, I was calling on my cousin because he was an alcoholic and he's like, he's violent. I'm going to call him, please. Um, but I think there's a lot of fear too involved with calling because once our, once our people get within the system, it's hard to get them out of the system. I have a nephew who was um, got in the system at age 12 He's just now getting out of prison and he's 34, 30, well, no, he's older than that. And so he's, um, we have a lot of fear of the system that's unkind and has, there's no sense of fairness. Um, and uh, native people just, there's a, you know, so I totally understand what you're saying. I totally understand. I also understand that we have a lot of uh, brothers and sisters who are our supporters. Um, Dr. Brian Jarrett, who um, I think, I don't know, if, uh, he's a great supporter of Native um, peacemaking and ways of doing, and he'd be the first to say that, um, you know, he's a supporter. Uh, we have to be aware of the ones who are, um, who are not our supporters, but that are I'm not quite sure. I don't, I, it's like we, there are those who are non-supporters who think they are. And, um, and they do a lot more harm than good for us. Um, but we do definitely have to recognize that we have incredible supporters who can speak for us. A lot of times, Dr. Jarrett, because he taught here in Alaska, um, he was able to get us to get into the court system because he is white, he is male, he's educated. Um, and for us to speak, and I've co-authored with him um, because I understand that in my effort to create change, I must have the supporters with me who that the system will listen to. 
Um, and uh, because they, what they see is they see a, a, a brownish face that's a foreigner. <laughs> uh, even in my own land, I'm a foreigner. So thank you. I really appreciate what you shared. I'd just like to hear about from some other people what they have to share too. We do have time. Pamela? Okay, I see you. Would you like to share? Um, no, okay. Um, I'm a teacher, so remember I'll call on you. Um, I, I've, I haven't seen that name. Did you just join us? Oh, wait, Madeline. Madeline, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just have a question, kind of, I guess, actually elaborating on like the previous conversation or, or comment that was made is as like an Indigenous woman working in, or really studying in academia, looking to work in academia, recognizing opportunities to decolonize those structures, um, almost as the barriers and limitations to education. Um, something that I've noticed, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of a lot of you've noticed, is there's a lot of lateral violence. And so there's this idea of mixed nations. And even where I'm from in Treaty 7, there's there's many, many nations that gather together. Um, and I find that it almost like deters and slows down change because individuals are at conflict with each other based on the teachings that they've received. And then there's almost this idea of like righteousness of like, well, this is not the way this is because this is how I was taught. And so that's something that I, I have a lot of great Indigenous academic mentors that have kind of shared their experiences about that um, with the realities, knowing that if you want to go in and change academic institutions, that you're going to have that resistance. But I guess like for me, that would be the last place I would have thought originally to have that resistance is within Indigenous peoples. Um, and so I guess like there definitely are a lot of supporters, so I don't want to undermine that and like focus on the negative, but I'm just interested to hear, I guess, like what you have to say to that. I think I heard, I know what I heard you say is that if you want to, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, is that we like creating change within an academic institution. They're the, um, the indigenous professors, are, are they the resistors? Or I think that like it also depends like I'm from the faculty of social work and so I think that our faculty is a little bit more progressive than other faculties uh, which I realized when working in the education faculty um, how different the pedagogies are and so I guess I'm just wondering maybe rather if you have any advice as someone who's looking to go into an institution and kind of um, I guess like address harms and inspire decolonization uh what you would have to say i know that's a huge question <laughs> <laughs> it's loaded um yeah i actually the first thing is to become aware there's an issue like the, what's the conflict here um for indigenous people and scholars a lot of the conflict for us is that our content is is different well actually it may not be our conflict so much as the non-indigenous institution educational institution because our content our pedagogy is not the same as theirs um i i teach a lot of history of colonization within my community because the, most of my students may not have may not know that there were boarding schools that took our youth away um in here in alaska as they did in canada so the so I, my foundation is is uh, is the history of Alaska Native people in Alaska. That's not often offered in other classes. And so what other what other pedagogy will do is look it will address problem Native people as problems. They're not looking at the problems that that preceded because we Native people had answers to a lot of issues. We survived on this incredibly cold climate and we had ways of getting along with each other. We had our laws that are based on ancient um, ancient laws, you know, laws of the land, as Mike Jackson like call it. So we actually were very civilized people. And so, um, and, and so when we go into the academic institution, a lot of what, what, who we are is missing. And so the, the resistance is usually from the non-Indigenous non people, um, people 
um, within the institutions. I kind of know what I'm talking about here because I just I just been working at an institution for five years. It's Alaska though. Alaska, we're we're we still have a lot of catching up to do. We're the last frontier. <laughs> so I hope I kind of answered some of your questions and how to address it. It's like um, it's getting together and starting the conversation and and start and start talking about uh, you know finding the supporters because you're going to find resistors everywhere. So they're they're dime a dozen, by the way. <laughs> I am a resistor sometimes. I have to just be aware of it. Oh, thank you for asking that question. Oh, let's see. Do we have any more comments, questions? Just a real quick comment. I, I spent 25 years in public health, so a lot of uh, community work, but all of the best practices or principles that you mentioned just overlap with community public health work. So that was interesting. Um, Cause yeah, you can't just bring change into a community top down. It has to come from community up. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, and I think that the, what I have learned from my own, re from this research, because I thought maybe I'm not adding anything new to the field of research, but I think what I've added that's new and it may not even actually is that outsiders as facilitators of change may be welcomed in indigenous communities. And I say this because from my own experience, uh, we, we should have more trained outsiders uh, to come into native communities to start the dialogue. And, and, it, and the reason I say this is because within my own community, there's all these invisible power structures that stop us from working together. You know, like we're, we're based in my community, we're clan. I'm, I'm from the, the small clan. So, and then there's always the hierarchy of, of speakers in our community that may not be representing all of us. So a trained facilitator is, uh, who um, may be um, trained in mediation, uh, facilitation, can keep that conversation healthy and safe and going. Um, I, I did a lot of co-facilitating with Dr. Jarrett and I could see he would go into these institutions and he would start with, I remember one mediation session where he, he where the, the members that they called together of this organization, they were in denial. They're like, we have no problem going on. Why, were, why are you even here? But that he never skipped a beat. He's trained for denial. So he kept going. And for, at the end of the day, they had already, they, they came out of denial. They started planning ways to, to, to work together. So I think that having trained facilitators as outsiders, they're not part of that problem, like a lot of the problems that are happening in the community. Um, I'm from the small community. I belong to a clan in my community. My mother may not have, may have gotten into, um, you know, may have been not the, like uh, gotten into trouble with somebody, another clan. So there's all this invisible forces at play. I think we should train facilitators. I think we should train inside facilitators as well to, to start the dialogue. So I think that's kind of, I don't know if it's new, but I think, you know, we're always, we're always saying that outsiders, um, we, we need to look at the role of outsiders. And the reason I say that is just because I work closely with Dr. Jarrett and I brought him to my community um, for the restorative justice uh, circle that we did. And he was very welcome. And if you know Dr. Jarrett, if you see him, he's a non-native, uh, he's tall. He, I don't know how else to describe him, but he definitely doesn't look like an insider, but he's, he made people feel comfortable. He never, he, he didn't have that discomfort within himself. I, that's the only way I could think is that well he's trained mediator he's a facilitator um, and he he always says that he may have had indigenous blood in one of his lifetimes but I'm not quite sure but he felt comfortable in a in a foreign land and um, and that we as native people we can sense discomfort a mile away and that would make us uncomfortable. So it's like he was trained. And so that's kind of started that idea that maybe we need to train outsiders to come in within our communities. Uh, dispute resolution, DSD, 
they they train to to create the change bring in mediation to organizations so i'm like why can't we do it one step further and do that with communities indigenous communities or any community so yeah i think that's the only thing that might be a little bit new that i can bring to the to the field i'm not quite sure <laughs> I may not have anything new to bring the field. I did five works of re five years of research, but I think it was new for me because it it really helped me. And I'm hoping that my research can help other communities that are trying to bring some for some form of conflict resolution process to their communities. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for anybody today? But I did have a question because something keeps coming up around a, uh, appropriation, cultural appropriation and indigenous practice and circles in particular, and who has permission and how do you get it and who's qualified and can you be trained or, you know, is there a certification process or all of that? Yeah. I. I, I'm glad that's a great question to ask is um, I belong to Native American Rights Fund. I'm, I'm, I sit on their Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative uh, Committee, our group of people that are peacemakers. And we did actually address that at one point because some peacemakers have been going forward and, and creating, getting a lot of money, you know, uh, creating peacemaking uh, circles. And they're not giving credit back to where they learned the process from from the Plinkett um, trainer people who train them, and so I personally do not have any problems with people practicing peacemaking. What I do have uh, the issue is uh, we should always recognize the people who trained us. Um, and um, you know, like today, I was mentioning Mike Jackson a lot, and I actually give credit to them for the knowledge that I'm sharing. Um, I'm, I'm basically sharing secondhand knowledge there, from what I learned from them with my research. But I also recognize that I bring a lot to my own research too, but you know, because of my, my experience um, trying to create change within my community. But cultural, mis, mis, cultural appropriation is a big thing uh, with native people. Uh, and um, it's, but with peacemaking, the way I feel comfortable, because if anybody's doing any kind of restorative justice process to create um, more balanced relationships and, and uh, healthier relationships, I say, go for it. And Mike Jackson actually said, nobody can own peacemaking. And, the, and I think when he said that, he meant that it's a spiritual process. It's not, it's not only the sitting in the circle, it's something that happens to us while we're in the circle or while when we become peacemakers you know i may never make it to a peacemaking circle um but i'm already a peacemaker if i've created that peace within and so mm -hmm. it's more it's more of a i think what he really meant is it's more of a a spiritual kind of happening um not that uh we stole it or that the white people have stolen it or the non-native people have stolen it from native people. If only they just give the credit to where credit is due. That's where I, I come well, from. Well, that's what I do. I always I always begin with the lineage of how I came to it, you know, because it's it's layered and it's not direct, but it is, you know, because I can trace where I was first introduced and how that person came and for, you know, from there and there and there, you know, down the the chain of events that led me to be where I am now, but it's an ongoing process because you're never there, you know, because right. we're all evolving, developing and learning. And it, we're all a part of a community that's helping us to do that. So it's not just one, it's all of us you right. know, working, working together. And the thing that struck me was you mentioned Harold Gatsby because he is a part of my lineage but yet there's this tension and this conversation going. I just got an email just today from one of my circle community people who was, she said she went online looking for some more information on helping her to frame her own framing of circle for other people. And she came across this website and it is talking, it's has some, uh, 
um, information from Harold and his and his brother Phil. Is it Phil? Yeah, Phil. Uh, and so they're talking about you know how they came into doing peacemaking circle work and traveling and you know spreading this around the world. And then there's another piece on that website that's um, you know confronting Kay Prentice as you know as one who is doing the cultural appropriation and capitalizing on this and you know and that. She in no way has any ties to Phil and, and Harold. And so there is this tension, you know, with with that and then also with Barry. Absolutely. Harold trained Barry Stewart. Right. They, they created this book, Barry and, um, and Kate Pranis on circle peacemaking. They only gave one sentence recognition to Harold Gatsby. And uh, well, so it's Mark, that, Kay, and, and Barry you know, that, that are the published authors. Yeah, right. And, and so there's, so there's that recognition that this is what's happened. And for years, Harold and Phil did not say anything until we made it an issue. We're like, Harold, you kind of need to know that this is what's happened. And I think because he is a peacemaker, he didn't want to make it an issue, mm -hmm. but he does say it. And now it's not even an issue. It's a recognition that um, this is what happened. And, um, and, and so if I were to want peacemaking within my circle, I would, or within my community, I would actually, and I have asked Harold, um, because, well, for one, Native people can, can relate to Native people. Um, we've, we've been told what to do, and we've been taught by non-Natives for so long that we, it actually falls on deaf ears. So we actually need to be teachers for one another. And, um, and I see where maybe Barry, Gatt Barry and uh, Kay Pranis, they brought, I can see where they can be supporters of the effort because they brought peacemaking to an audience that probably wouldn't hear us. Um, but I still would like if they would just recognize Harold as, uh, and Phil as being the ones who taught them. They were the teachers. It's an amazing story, super amazing story. And I don't know if you actually heard where, when Barry was the judge in Whitehorse and he came and uh, to Burwash, no, not Burwash, um, Harcross where Harold was. And they wanted to bring in funding to start peacemaking. Harold says, let's just start today. Let's right. just, you're here, let's just start. And, um, and that's how it started. Uh, that's how that's how it started in car cross peacemaking is 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 like um what mike jackson said it's like it we can't own it and it, anybody can claim peacemaking well it's everywhere it's yeah it's, it's part of the human um condition if we choose to honor and respect it you're right you're absolutely right so I'm of two schools here, you know, with um, appropriation. I don't really, because, because Mike, who is the true, who is a very incredible peacemaker, Mike Jackson, when he says we don't own it, you know, he, he gave, gave me all these loaded stuff to think about. And, you know, because I'm a researcher in an academic institution, we don't really talk about spiritual things, but our new, you know, when you talk about, um, about um, consciousness, um, shifting of consciousness and mindset, it should include the spiritual aspect. It needs to, um, because our brains got us into this mess, our thinking. We need to create a more, a more relation, a relationship with the spirit within our hearts. And, um, and you know, I don't know, I think that cre getting, getting closer to, to, um, to the land uh, for me has worked. Like um, then I start becoming more conscious of all living beings, the water, the air, you know, that I breathe, it's all living. Well, knowledge is alive. So it, it, this is our things that our institutions that are pretty much made by a white um, hierarchy uh, of males, they're not, they don't understand. So it's like, how can we actually tell them? So Brian, Jarrett, 
he's saying you call it sacred spaces don't talk about spirit call it sacred spaces <laughs> they can understand sacred spaces maybe so it's like well, fine. And I'm, at, I'm at a and i'm at a jesuit university so you know of course um you know they they embrace a lot of diversity of thought um as far as how you couch it or, or frame it there was a presentation just yesterday about the jesuits and their you know participation in um one of the reservations i don't i don't remember which which one it was but um the how you know their role in perpetuating the boarding schools and on uh, you know from in this particular in south dakota and you know what can we can we be healed from this legacy of participation in that being you know part of the jesuit college university network and what can what can they do to reconcile all of the harms that have been perpetuated so that was just yesterday but um i just took a course at the um, vermont law school on um, restorative justice and in indigenous communities and the person the the, the professor it was an indigenous person and our our project assignment was to present on some indigenous practice within indigenous some practice within an indigenous community. So mine was on um, Ubuntu as an African tradition coming from the indigenous nature of what it means in that context. And so, um, as you said, you know we're all indigenous to some place and we have our own practices and ways of how we can raise and honor humanity and each other. Fantastic. And that's <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I'm very excited for, um, for the new consciousness that's happening. It's, it's happening everywhere, it's new energy. And I'm just part of it, you know, I'm a small part of it, but that this is where we need to go to, to, to help with our environment, you know, our, our climate, our environment, uh, the trees are asking for our help. You know, the waters are asking for our help, and we need to start joining hands and start working together and becoming um, one voice, and uh, you know, and and joining with the with finding the sacred space within us and within our planet. You know, um, what I and there's all this discussion about like how universities are recognizing native lands, but they're not doing much else. You know, but I'm like. I don't, well, for me, I just need to hear the recognition. It makes, it makes it, it makes, there's, there's like, reckon, there's a peacefulness to know that they're now recognizing they stole our land. Right. I don't really, you know, I'm not about getting the land back. I just want them to recognize it. Um, because in Canada, when they recognize the, the residential schools and they started talking about the truth and reconciliation, they, once a government recognized it and made their apology, however sincere or insincere they were, they made it, they, they became part of the history of Canada. So now mm -hmm. that, right. that part is becoming part of the, the classroom teachings. We did, we're so far from it in Alaska still. Their people are so unaware of what, of what actually happened to the Native well, there's people. there's a new little, I don't know if you would call it a documentary that just came out. Um, and it's about the um, evolution of the restorative, restorative justice initiative here in Seattle through the courts with Saron Fong. And in it, it traces his introduction back to um, Harold and Mark and, Gary and Barry Stewart. And so there's a, an interview on YouTube kind of, you know, um, about the like a, a like a talk about the film but harold i believe is on the panel with with saram and the filmmakers and so, so when you set up the google resource folder i'll find it and put it in there because it's really interesting you know again to hear you know how you know the lineage of how it came to seattle this, yes. this movement of, of circles and peacemaking came directly from, I mean, as a direct pipeline to um, the Yukon territory. 
It's amazing. Uh, have um, Jose, have, have you ever meet Harold and, and his brother Phil yet? I, I actually haven't had the opportunity. Uh, if you'd <laughs> love to make an introduction, I'd be more than honored. Thank you so much. They are well, they so They would be ones amazing. to get on your, get into your, per I mean, get, do a session with. Yeah, yeah. I, we're, when we started this, I uh, had no idea where it would be going, but it's been a wonderful journey nonetheless. <laughs> so, but you, yeah, can, but, you have something to share? Go ahead. Well, I just want to say, um, they're so busy. They, they teach peacemaking from their from their their homes now together as brothers but they're so busy they're all over the world teaching peacemaking as a way of life like um the process itself the circle itself is uh, the, it comes from peacemaking as a way of life but they are so amazing because you know harold will say he, he got his training and his education in jail as a 12 year old youth you know and and he he's like he's not educated and, and you know, and he he never really encouraged me to get my PhD. <laughs> He's like, you can, they're not going to allow spirit in the university. I mean, he does talk like that, you know. And his brother is always the peacemaker. He's always calming things down because Harold will just kind of pave his way through, and he'll say things that you don't want to hear, you know. And he he came in, he beamed into Alaska, and he says, Alaska's thirty years behind all of us here in Canada. And, and there's all these people from the state court system sitting there getting all uncomfortable. But you know what? That's that's the change that we need. We need to hear the people that make us uncomfortable, you know, and then and then Phil is always behind him kind of patting things down, putting things in place. They're hilarious. So anyway, they're just amazing. And they also have a wilderness camp that they teach peacemaking. But since COVID, they haven't done that. But I went to their wilderness camp. So anyway, I better, I know you guys are busy, but it's been wonderful. Thank you for inviting me, Jose. I do want to thank you so, just thank you, um, Polly, for providing us this wonderful opportunity to learn about your community and your research. Uh, it was very beautifully just woven together, very thoughtfully provoking, a lot of kernels of knowledge. I just really love your honesty and um, the fact that you, consistently are like, I may not know the answer to that. And you actually know more than you give yourself credit for. So <laughs> uh, thank you. And thank you for reminding us about the importance of dialogue um, and just sharing it with the community and how beautiful that is. So thank you for allowing us to be a guest at your home today and continue to uplift voices. Uh, and last but not least, thank you for everyone who joined today. It was such a wonderful dialogue <laughs> back and forth between everyone uh, who's joined us from different parts uh, of the world. And we deeply appreciate your interest and support in sitting down at our table to learn about Indigenous communities near and far through our cultural talk story series.